So I want you to imagine just for a second, if you were to wake up tomorrow and open up your Bible to do a devotion, and when you opened up your Bible, all the pages were blank. You couldn't find any words in the Bible. What would you do if you woke up tomorrow and there was no Bible? So maybe, maybe you, you think this is wrong, and so you open up that Bible app on your phone, but when you're looking through it, there's no scriptures there. And so you jump on Facebook to try to figure out what Michael's going to post on our church page today, and there's no scripture there because there is no Bible, right? So maybe you, you think this must be wrong, and you go into your living room and open up an, another Bible, but the pages on that Bible is blank. What would it be like if the world did not have a Bible? Like maybe you go to the library and you, you start looking for Bibles there and you can't find one. So then you look at all the books that might have been influenced by the Bible and there's far less on the shelf because, well, there's just a world with no Bible. Can you imagine a world with no Bible? Like if, you, if you think about it, without Scripture as that anchor point holding you down, how do you decide like where your identity lies? How do you I, decide what is right or wrong? good or evil. Like if there's a, a world without a Bible, you have these subjective opinions on what is good, what is justice, right? And the subjective opinions is a lot like the ice cream question. Like what do you believe the best fa- flavor of ice cream? And if there's nothing if there's nothing that transcends, nothing that's more objective than what you believe, then what you believe reigns supreme, right? And so the, the world without a Bible would be a world that is maybe a little more less hopeful, right? Maybe we have a hard time understanding who we are because if you look at how the world defines us, it has to do with what's natural, right? And as long as it can be seen in nature, then we can understand it to exist. But it has no idea of what's going on in, in outside of nature. And so maybe the most your identity can be formed is what is natural about you, right? But we have to be more than that. And so without scripture, what do we anchor ourselves down to? And I think scripture is ultimately that anchor point, that that foundation that that holds us in place. Like when I went to uh, Maui over the summer, we went uh, snorkeling and we got off these uh, boats that took us out to this bay where the waters were calm. And we got off these boats and, and walked down the stairs that w- just led into the water. And I jumped in the water and it was clear and you could see all the fish. But one thing that immediately got my attention was the giant rope going from the boat all the way to the ground, right? Where it was holding the boat in place. Without, without that anchor, all the boats that were inside of that bay would have just floated around and gone wherever the, the waters would have taken them. Without, without that anchor holding that boat in place, the, the currents and the waves would have maybe crashed those ships together, right? And, and we're a lot like that boat. We need something to anchor us, to hold us down. When we have this idea of who am I, it's not a subjective thing. Who we are comes from outside of ourselves. Who we are is what God has told us about ourselves, right? That we are good. Um, what is good? What is evil? To answer those questions, you, you, you can't just look at society around you because there has to be something above that, something that, that is not subjective like the leaders or you know, the prophets or the judges, something that, that is more stable. right? We have to look outside of that in order to understand what true justice is and what good and evil. And that's what Micah has been dealing with. If you remember last week, we talked about this idea that the people of Judah and the people of Israel, remember Micah is a a book that speaks to both the northern and the southern kingdom. The first part with its prophecy to the northern kingdom and the second part, and actually the third part mostly with the prophecy to Judah. And and the people of Israel kind of forgot who God was. They, They didn't forget his name, but they just mixed him with the other gods, the other idols. And so he was just one more of the already too many gods. And because they forgot who God was, it distorted their perception of good and evil, and they began to oppress people, right? Even their prophets was, was forsaking the word of God. We had the prophets last week that, you know, the prophet that they wanted to, to listen to was the one that would lead them to wine and beer. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, that's the prophet they wanted to listen to. So when we get to chapter 3, Micah is going to bring us into this new idea. And it's, it's, he's going to show us why God is going to judge the nation of Judah 
but he's going to start with the leaders. And I want you to see that you are a leader at some er element in your life. Whether you're a leader of the church, or you're a leader at, the, at your job, or you're a, a teacher in your classroom, you're a leader in some area of your life. And this part of Micah is going to be something that speaks specifically to leaders. What kind of leaders are we to be? And what kind of leaders cause the people of Israel to go astray? And the reason Israel went astray is because, well, they forgot God. They began to follow idols. They forsook God's word. And they lost that idea that, that anchor that held them down or the moral compass that told them what right and wrong was. So if you look at me with chapter three, here's where it starts. It says, then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob and you rulers of Israel. See, it's a message to the leaders and the rulers. Should you not embrace justice? Now, I started off with this idea of, of God being that anchor point. Because for us as Christians, we need to have a foundation that is outside of just what is natural. A foundation based on who we are. And, and look at this, if you will, in some um, 89 verse 14. I actually want you guys to read this with me. In, in Psalm 89 verse 14, you can turn there. It's also behind me. And, and I want you guys to read it out loud with me. Don't just look at it. Read it out loud with me because I want you to see where our anchor point and where our foundation is for things like justice. Here's what it says. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. It's a beautiful verse, so we should probably read it again. Here's what it says. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. So if I'm reading that right, the writer of that psalm is saying that the foundation of justice, how we even know what justice is, starts with God's throne. Did you guys see that when I read it? The foundation for how we understand justice begins at God's throne because he's the one who tells us what is righteous and what is just. As we look through the prophet Amos, the idea of righteousness came out a lot and it has to do with God making things right to restore peace in the world, right? And then the Hebrew word is mispah, which um, just has to do with God making things right, restoring shalom, peace, right? And so... I looked at the English term for justice. In the Oxford uh, Dictionary, it says to, to give what is just. Now, it drives me crazy whenever somebody uses a word in the definition of that word. So I had to look up now, what is the definition of just? And the Oxford Dictionary said just is what is morally right and fair. That's the idea of just, what is morally right and fair. And I had to ask the question, and maybe you ask it too, how do we as people know what is morally right or fair? You can all pick up your Bible. You can look again at Psalm 89 because righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. It's not a subjective question whether, like what is the best flavor of ice cream. True justice is what is morally right, and we can only understand what is morally right when we have a foundation in our hand. Scripture. And the leaders of Israel should have understood or at least embraced what was just, shouldn't they? That's what, that's what they, at the very least, they should have embraced justice because they were supposed to be the people of God. And God is the one who shows us what justice is. And so look again, listen, leaders of Jacob and rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? That's Micah chapter three. The problem with Israel is their leaders didn't embrace justice. And I want you to see, this is my first point. Without God, the world distorts justice. Without God, the world distorts justice. If you have your Bible, you can write that in there. You can write it on your notes. You should all be taking notes, right? Without God, the world distorts justice. And that's a really important point because justice is a hot topic today. Like everybody wants justice, right? But we have to ask like, who's justice? I'm telling you, if justice has a foundation that's based on the throne of God, then we should be looking for biblical justice, right? And so the people of Israel, they forsook biblical justice. And when they forsook God, 
verse two says, you hate good and love evil. That's what happens to the leaders. They hate good and they love evil because they don't have their foundation on the rock because they're not anchored to who God is and his character. And so my challenge to you, Christian, is that you make sure that you're anchored to the character of God, that your foundation is on the rock, that the scripture informs your worldview, that you live your life based on this, right? As leaders, because we're all leaders. Now listen to to what Micah says about the leaders. This is verse two. You hate good and you love evil who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones into pieces, who chop them up like meat on a pan, like flesh on a pot. Now, I looked and there is nowhere in in any history that shows Israel being a culture that were cannibals. They didn't actually eat people. They didn't boil people in pot. They didn't strip their skin. When you look at scripture and it uses cannibalism, it uses it figuratively in order to show what happens when those who are in authority, those rulers and leaders that should have embraced justice, when they oppress people, scripture talks about it as as if they're eating off of those people, as if they're feeding off of those people. And so what is happening in Israel that's causing God to come down and judge, those leaders, those in authority, were treating people as if they didn't matter. They were living off of them. Now, Jeremiah talks about this, how, how the kings would have their castles built without, you know, without paying the laborers or with feeding the laborers. And so when, when people are oppressed, this is what God causes God to, to spring into action, right? In, in Exodus, if you read the story, God heard the cries of his people as they were oppressed. And as we're looking at Micah and we see these leaders who are consuming their their subjects, the ones that that they should have been able, they should have been leading, instead they were consuming them, God springs to action. And this is what God does if you look at verse four. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time, he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. And I just wanna show you that when people treat others as if they don't matter, when they consume them, God turns his face on those type of people. Scripture talks about God turning his face on those types of people who who, uh, turn their face on on, on their fellow man, right? And so I just want you to see in this first point, the world distorts true justice. True justice comes from God, but they're not able to see it in their leaders. Maybe they might see it in their religious leaders. You think that? But not in this time. Look at what happens in uh, verse five. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. Right? These are prophets. And, and if you give them something to eat, then you're going to have a pretty good, you know, you're, I'm going to give you a good prophecy, but heaven forbid you don't feed me, right? Because then I'm going to wage war against you. I'm going to tell you how bad it's going to be. The point is, there was a, if you are looking for justice in this world, you're not going to be able to find it in those in authority, right? Because they're just in it for themselves. You're not going to be able to find it in those religious leaders, those those prophets, because they're just interested in getting their belly full. They're much more interested in in filling their stomach, right? Than, Than they are in faith. And so where in this world are people going to go to find justice? It's not in the leadership. By the way, God says that he's going to punish those prophets. He talks about making it dark. That's verse six. The night will come over those without visions and darkness without divination. The sun will set on the prophets like the day they will go dark before them. And this is the reason in verse seven, it says the seers will be ashamed and the diviners grace are disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. So what's happening is the people are looking for justice from their leaders, they're not finding it. The people are looking for justice between in their religious leaders and they're not finding it. And so God is turning his face from them. In verse nine, we see this whole thing again. Listen to what it says. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, rulers of Israel, who who despise justice and distort what is right. In verse 11, her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price. Do you see that? I just, in this first point, all I want you to see is that if you're a person looking for justice at this time, and maybe today, if you're a person looking for justice and you look for it and you hope in it, in those leaders, you're not going to find it. 
And if you, you look for it in, in those religious leaders that are all in it for themselves to get their own belly full, you're not going to find it. And if you look for it in the judge who judges, who gives their orders based on a bribe, you're not going to find it. The only place we're going to find true justice, the only place we're going to try to find what's truly morally right and good doesn't come from the world around us. Right? It's just not going to be found there. And, and these people might like proclaim that it's there. This is my favorite part of this first chapter. In verse 11, it says, her leaders, and judge, judge, her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they look for the Lord's support and they say, is not the Lord among us? No, no disaster will come upon us. This is that catchphrase, right? Maybe they printed it on their money, right? Maybe they, they said it when they were saying their pledge of allegiance, right? No, we, we, we're not, God's not going to judge us. We, we, the Lord is with us. The Lord is among us. Yet even though they proclaim this, it wasn't true because they fed off the people. They gave prophecy based on what you were going to feed them. They judged as long as you gave them a bribe. You cannot find true biblical justice in the world systems. The only place you're going to find true biblical justice is when you're filled with the power of God. And I want you to see that about Micah because Micah is somebody who is about justice. In fact, there's only one leader in chapter one that truly cares about justice. And that's in verse eight. He says, but as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and Israel his sins. The one place in chapter three where we find somebody who is truly about biblical justice is, is Micah, who is about biblical justice because he's filled with the spirit of the Lord. And that's you, Christian. If you've been baptized, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And this text informs our worldview. We should be people of, of mishpah, of, of justice, right? Trying to promote peace in the world. We should be those people that promote true biblical justice to a world that desperately needs it. And we don't get to decide what is just. That's not for us because true justice is not subjective. True justice has a foundation as the throne of God. Now, my second point in chapter four, and, and we're gonna keep moving I'm going to get through five today. My second point, chapter four, is that God, in God's kingdom, we find hope for true justice. In, in God's kingdom, we find hope for true justice. So if you're looking for true justice in the world, you're not going to find it. Can't hope in your leaders. They're not going to, it's not about true justice there. Even those religious leaders, if, if, you, if you're not following those people that follow the word of God, you're not really going to find justice there. Those judges are going to judge based off a of bribe. If you're looking for justice in the world system, it's just distorted. It's not there. True justice, the hope for true justice is found in the kingdom of God. And, and, and look at what verse four or chapter four says, in the last days. Now, this is the first time we've heard the last days. Uh, Joel talked about the last days and Paul or Peter proclaimed that this was the last days on Pentecost, right? So he's talking about the time that we're living in here now. And I, I, I will show you more about that. But it says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the heights of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and people will swarm to it. Like that's the day that we're looking for. A day where all people are swarming. Like that's, that's a lot of people. Have you ever seen a swarm? Like all people are swarming to the mountain of God, Right? Many nations will come and they'll say this. Now, I actually got to experience this. I, as, I, as I left, uh, as I visited Israel and I left, I, I left and we were going towards Jerusalem, our whole bus started singing this song. And I don't know if it's the song from Micah or if it, because Isaiah repeats this same song. And we don't know which one wrote it first because they, they lived during the same or roughly during the same time. And so who said it first? I don't know. But we sang this song as we, we drove, as the bus entered into Jerusalem. It said, uh, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord, the temple of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that many will walk in his paths. Now, we were more eloquent. You want me to sing it for you? Come on, people. 
<laughs> Bill says yes. It, 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 we, we would sing it we, as we drove in there. It was, come, let's go to the mountain. Come, let's go to the Lord. Come, let's go to the mountain. He'll teach us his ways, right? I remember the rabbi that, that uh, was, was bringing us and, and doing the tour guide. I remember him saying that, that we're looking forward to the fulfillment of this uh, scripture, like that's what, if we're looking forward to the fulfillment of the scripture when all nations will come and Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem. But it just didn't make sense to me because I want to live in the kingdom now. I'm not looking forward to, to, to like I, I'm part of this kingdom today, right? And, and the reason it didn't make sense to me is something that the writer of Hebrews said about this mountain. In Hebrews chapter 12, I believe it's verse 22. It says this, But you have come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyfully, joyful assembly. So something happened in these last days where the real mountain that we're looking forward to isn't that mountain in Israel. It's the mountain in Jerusalem, the, the kingdom of heaven, right? It's the Jerusalem of heaven that we're looking forward to, right? And that's the one that, that the book of Hebrews tells us that we get to go to today that we're in Christ, right? And so here we are in Micah and he's talking about this time. And I'm telling you, you're living in this time now where all nations go to that mountain, all nations will come and say, come, let's go to the mountain, the temple of God. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. See, if we're looking to, for justice, we're only going to find it in the ways that, of God. We're only going to find it when we're walking along God's path. Not our own, not the world's, but God's path. And when we're walking on God's path, we're going to find true biblical justice. And see, this this prophecy in which Micah looks forward to today is coming true as all nations stream into this heavenly Jerusalem wanting to know who the one true God is. Wanting to know what is he like. Wanting to know his law. See, that's what verse 2 goes on to say. So he'll teach us, they, they may walk in his paths. The law will go out from, from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many people. See, that's the kingdom. And inside the kingdom, which we're all part of, all nations get this chance to, to uh, learn God's ways, to walk on in his paths, and to, to learn his law. Remember, Jesus gave us that law when he stood on the mountain, and he gave us that sermon on the mount. We get to learn his law, right? And in this kingdom, we have a hope of true justice, of true peace. See, here's what it says in verse three. He will judge between many people and settle disputes for strong nations for a while. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. See, I wanna live in that kingdom, the one that, that isn't picking up weapons of war, but weapons of production. That's the kind of kingdom that I wanna live in. It goes on to say this, Nations will take up sword. Or no, nations will not take up sword against nation. Nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. And here's why we can trust in this: for the Lord Almighty has spoken. Now that's powerful, and I'm telling you that inside the kingdom, inside the church, we have hope for this kind of peace. Because as I was reading chapter three, I was thinking, what is the hope in God coming to judge? Well, for those that are, are oppressing others, well, that should cause fear. But to those who are being oppressed, that should bring a little bit of hope. God is going to come and make things right. And so now they have hope that God is going to come and make things right. And, and they look forward to this future kingdom, which we have a glimpse of today. We, we are part of that kingdom. And when we're living up to the kingdom standards, and I think that's, that's why I, I wrote this point as, as in the kingdom we have hope of true justice. Because when us as Christians are living up to kingdom standards, we're going to find true justice. We're going to be people who, as Jesus would say, are peacemakers, right? Right? And, and Jesus, 
doesn't say that, you know, the world is always going to treat us fairly, right? In fact, he says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. But what he does say is that we should treat others with justice, right? And then he tells us something even greater about justice. He, he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And that's what justice is, right? And then he says, but I tell you, you know, someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other. Someone takes your cloak and, you know, like go with him a mile. Jesus, you know, gives us this upside down view of something more than justice, but mercy. And isn't that the God that we serve? One that is just and one that ensures that, that the world is going to be brought to justice. But for those whose faith is in Christ, we get mercy. See, that's, that's the hope that I have in living in this, this uh, kingdom. By, by being a Christian today who, who stands at the mountain of Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem. And when I live out the, the characteristics of that kingdom, then, then justice will flow like a river. I got one more point. And... Uh, well, I had so many more points, but you guys are only going to get get this this next one. Um, my third point, and this is in chapter five. Jesus is the king of justice and mercy. In this kingdom that we live in today, we have hope in, in a justice. And as long as you as, as citizens of the kingdom are living out the mandates that, that God has given us, well, you know, we're going to find things like peace and an absence of fear. And remember that that Hebrew word for justice is always linked to peace because God is going to come and make things right and restore peace to a world. That's what the Hebrew mishpat means. But in chapter 5, verse 2, we get to see that there's going to be a king that's coming. And again, we live in the fulfillment of this promise. But there's going to be a king that's coming. And my third point is justice is a king. Is, Jesus is the king of justice and mercy. In verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel and whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And then when Jesus is born, Herod's wondering, like, where's the Messiah supposed to be born at? And they point to this scripture and they say in Bethlehem, and we all know what Herod did next, right? Because the people during that time understood what this text meant. That it had not yet been fulfilled. That they were looking forward to a Messiah who was coming and he was going to be born in the, the lowliest of communities. In Bethlehem. Does anything good come from Bethlehem? But yet, that's where the Messiah is going to come from. He's going to come from Bethlehem, but his origins are going to be from old. Try to figure that one out. This king that's born has been around from old? Are we talking about the Messiah? Yes, and we see that fulfillment in Christ. And so, although, verse 3 says this, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. I just want to throw something out there. God punished the people of, of Israel. He punished them because they, there was no justice. They, they called evil good and good evil. They oppressed others. And those, those others called out to God and God heard their prayers. And so he sends Assyria to take care of the northern kingdom of Israel. And then he sends Babylon to take care of the southern kingdom of Judah. But you might think, well, that's it. That's the end of the story. But see, here's the powerful thing about covenants. And I want you to know our God is a God of covenants. Here's the powerful thing about covenants. When God promises something to us in a covenant, he's binding himself to that promise. And so God had promised Abraham, out of you, all nations will be blessed, out of your offspring, right? So God had a promise that he was still yet to fulfill to those people of Israel. And so he's not going to distort them forever because God is true to his word. And so God comes at just that right time and Jesus is born, the son of David, just as God had promised to Abraham and to David. God brought the Messiah. 
through Jesus. See, God is not going to abandon him, abandon Israel. He didn't. He sent the son who was born in Bethlehem, right? And now we're part of that new Israel. And I just want to point out in verse 4, this, this Messiah is going to be someone who brings true peace. See, he will, stand, he will stand and shepherd his flock. Jesus is the good shepherd. In the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. See, he's going to do it on, in God's strength because Jesus is God in the flesh. And they will live securely for then his greatness will reach to the end of the earth. And then the first part of verse five, and he will be our peace. Isn't that a beautiful verse? I want you to see as we've gone through chapter three, four, and five, that the people have longed for justice, but justice doesn't come from the world around them, does it? No, true justice is found in the heavenly Jerusalem. When people go to to the heavenly Jerusalem to learn his word, to walk in his path, true justice is seen in Jesus, but something even more beautiful than true justice is seen in Jesus. Mercy is seen in Jesus. Because Jesus didn't demand justice for himself. He willingly offered his life so that we could receive mercy. And so if you want a more just world, perhaps the best way to do it is to show mercy to others. That's that upside down kingdom that that Jesus has brought us. You know, if you want to be great, become the least. If you want want justice in the world, don't demand it for yourself. Right? Right? We look forward to something, and I wanted to end with this verse. It's in Revelation, and it's in verse, or chapter uh, 19, and it's verse 11. And I love this because I think so many people are looking for justice in the world, looking for it in their leaders, looking for it in their prophets, looking for it in their judges, but they're not finding it because true justice only comes from God. It's, it's the foundation of his, stone, uh, of his throne. And when we get to Revelation chapter 11, it says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider was called faithful and true. With justice, he judges and wages war. Right? Jesus is the God of justice. Jesus is the one who's going to bring justice into the world. And until that day, we can only try to live according to his word. We can only try to be those people that that don't just show justice, but show mercy. There's so much more that uh, I, like, Mike has been a fun book. I've hoped you enjoyed it. Um, we're going we're gonna to continue through it. But I just want to remind you as, as we, we go through it that true justice Knowing what is morally right and fair is not something you're going to find in the world. Its foundation is on the throne of God.